Thanks be to God. Have you ever been thrown into a situation where you were completely ill-equipped to succeed? Someone threw you in and you were lost at sea and there was no hope. I've had a couple of those, hopefully not this morning, but uh, I remember one in fourth grade. I'd been taking piano lessons for a couple years and I wasn't great yet. And it was the end of the year, and it was the time for the piano recital, when my teachers, all of his students, gathered together for this big recital for all the parents, and I was at the local Catholic church, Our Lady of Good Counsel. And I went, and I sat down, and there was no program, um, but it's, you know, I don't know if you've been in those things, you start with the beginners, and you end, you know, with the strongest and the, and the best. And I was sitting there, and unbeknownst to me, my teacher thought I couldn't make it, so he didn't schedule me. So I hear the first couple play chopsticks and, you know, the, you know, the easy stuff, and then it slowly gets better, and then I kind of pick my spot, and I'm like, I know I'm next. And I wasn't next, and each pianist got better and better and better, and I'm feeling worse and worse and worse because I just know they're going to call me next, and I'm just going to be a laughing stock. I'm going to be out of my depth. And so this pit starts in my stomach, and I start sweating, and I'm getting more and more nervous, and the pianists keep getting better and better and better. And finally, in the fellowship hall of Our Lady of Good Counsel, I gave my parents some good counsel. Let's get out of here before he calls me. <laughs> and we scrammed, and, and I actually never played the piano again, which is... <laughs> Which is very sad for you because you have never heard the theme to Star Wars played the way it was meant to be played. <laughs> oh. We're in the middle of a series called I Believe in God, But. Those times when we have the greatest theology, the best beliefs, and yet our lives and our choices in those places we, f we act as functional atheists where what we believe hasn't translated into how we live. And I wonder how many of us have felt or even feel today that though you believe in God, you're not convinced you can become the type of person he's called you to be. Maybe you look around and you see your roommate and he is gives himself half hour, 45 minutes, an hour of devotion every morning and you say, that's not me. I'm not there yet. Maybe you look at your friend and, and she commits all this time to service. And this other guy does all these works of evangelism. And then you've got this other friend who's so wise in the Lord. And you're like, that's not me. I wonder if I can become that person. Maybe God left me out. And when we feel that way, it can feel devastating, can't it? I have been there. And you feel embarrassed guilty, even ashamed. But we can't stay there for long, can we? And so we move on to apathy and maybe cynicism. Guess kingdom of God's not my thing. And it gives us insight into that one servant in the parable of the talents who was given one, one talent. And maybe out of shame or guilt or embarrassment or apathy or cynicism, he buried it in the ground. Some of us feel like that today. We thought we were called by God, but we don't feel like we have a lot to offer, and so we bury what it is we have in the ground and hope for the best. Maybe you believe in God, but you're not so sure you can change. Well, I have good news for you today. You can't. Huh? <laughs> That's supposed to be good news. It is. You can't change. I have better news. You're also not called to do it alone. How many of us have come to faith out of our own power, our own goodness, even our own initiative? None of us. None of us did. It was God who acted. 
It was God who pursued us. It was God who sent his son. It was God who welcomed us into his kingdom. And if that's true, then why do we expect God to change the rules and suddenly expect that after we've come to faith, God looks at us and says, figure it out. Do it on your own. I hope it works out for you. No. Our passage tells us that when God calls us into faith, he wants us to grow. But he helps us to grow as well. Man, if you've got your Bibles, if you're in Ephesians 4, verse 11 is so encouraging because it talks about the gifts that God, through his son Jesus Christ, has given us so that we might be the people he created us to be. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Christ has given us gifts so that we can become the people that he designed us to be. What are those gifts? Well, it says he's given us leaders in faith. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, those were more outward, speaking to the world, calling people to faith, but he gives us other leaders too, doesn't he? He gives us pastors and teachers and parents and professors and Bible school teachers, Lord willing chaplains. Residence directors, RAs. He gives us those people who care for us and can encourage us in our growth and in our maturity. But he gives us more than that. He gives us the body of Christ. He gives us this room and then some. And he fills it with people, with friends who have our best interests at heart and our growth at heart. He gives us his word of God, for he can't ask us to grow into the likeness of his son and not tell us what he looks like. He can't ask us and doesn't ask us to grow in the ways in which Jesus loved without showing us how Jesus loved. And so he's given us his word so that as we read it, we see what type of person he wants us to become. And finally, we've been talking about this a lot lately, he's given us his spirit. We did a series in the fall on the Holy Spirit. And the reason was not so we'd have this great theology of the Spirit. Not at all. The reason was that we would understand that the Holy Spirit lives inside us. We've heard that for a long time, but do we believe it? Do we know the impact of that? That the same Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead exists in me and exists in you? Oh my goodness. How can I not change if that spirit lives in me? God hasn't said, go figure it out. He said, I place my spirit in you. With his help, I'm going to empower you. I'm going to equip you to grow and to mature. This isn't my tradition, but I love it. Would you turn to your neighbor and say something, please? First say neighbor. <laughs> All right. Hey. Neighbor, the spirit of the living God dwells within me. Say that. And one more thing. And one more thing. And I cannot help but be changed. Amen. Amen. We have said it. We have said it. Let's believe it. Because indeed, the spirit of the living God dwells in you and in me, and we can't help but be changed. And so God gives us the gifts, the people to surround us, the spirit within us. But he also gives us a plan, doesn't he? As we continue to read, we see that God has given us a way to respond to this partnership with the spirit and the body of Christ around us. He says, I want to equip you for works of service. Be people of grace. He says, I want you to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Be a person of truth. 
And he says, I want you to become mature. I want you to take on the character of God. Become people of grace and truth and character. And not just some of us. All of us. There is no JV in the kingdom of God. We're all varsity. We're all called to grow. It's not like some don't, and the really good Christians do. God invites us all to grow, and he's equipped us all. I don't know about you, but everybody I've met loves infants. <laughs> They're so cute. They're snuggly. They burp. You know, I love, you know, having an you know, infant on your chest and falls asleep. It's the cutest thing in the world. And yet, parents, there's some parents here. We don't want our kids to stay infants forever, do we? <laughs> no, thank you. Um, we, we want them to learn to talk. We want to learn, them to learn to go to the bathroom on their own. <laughs> no more diapers. <laughs> we want them to grow up to people who shovel the snow. In the winter of 2014 is what we want. <laughs> we want them to mature. We don't want them to lock in to where they used to be. But we want them to grow and to develop. You know, spiritually, there's some infants in the room today. And I want you to know that's okay. Some of you have just come to faith in the last few months. And you're still growing some of you may have come to faith a long time ago, and you're just learning that God wants you to grow. It's okay. Sometimes I think it's a lie of the enemy that tells us that we're going to become saved one day, and we're going to turn to the Apostle Paul the next. Even the Apostle Paul didn't become Paul the next day. He went away into the wilderness. He sat under other teachers. And then it was almost a decade later that he led his first, mission, his first trip for the gospel. But God's desire and intention is that we grow. He has so much in store for us, and we can't accomplish it until we're ready. I've almost made it through an entire message without talking about Elijah. Oh, so close. Um, <laughs> Elijah, my son's eight. And every year, he can do things with me that he couldn't do the year before. We can watch hockey together, which I love. We have these conversations that he could never have had two, three, four years ago. We went on a walk this last fall um, with the dog, and he's chatting the whole time, and he's telling me what he's experiencing at school and his friendship. He's trying to interpret it and make sense of it. And we get home, and he says, can we keep walking? I'm not done talking yet. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was awesome. And there are more to come. He's only a third grader. Just imagine what can happen when he's a fifth grader, a senior in high school. Ah. Oh. I'm excited, and God is excited for the things that he can do in you and through you as you grow, as you mature in the faith. So don't be afraid. Don't let doubt or shame keep you from maturing into the woman or the man of faith that God created you to be. Use the gifts God has given you. Learn to recognize his voice Learn to see the movement of his spirit and what it looks like to follow. May we grow as the body of Christ in this place, not simply for ourselves, but for one another and for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.